All right. Welcome, everyone. Happy Friday to you. I hope you all are all doing well and safe. Um, thank you so much for being with us virtually, joining us for this critically important discussion on domestic violence in our community. My name is Rachel Brown, and I am a news anchor and reporter at ABC7, and I am absolutely thrilled to be here and to join this discussion. On a personal note, uh, this is an issue that's near and dear to my heart because both my grandmother and my best friend are both DV survivors. So this is such an important conversation and time willing, we will have questions at the end. Please feel free to submit questions in the chat box. You see it on your Zoom screen. And again, we're gonna get to as many as we can. But we do have some very special panelists to introduce, panelists that have so much to share, so much experience. And without further ado, I am going to hand it over to Tu Lin. Thank you so much, Rachel. Um, and thank you to everyone who's um, agreed to, to join us today for this discussion. Um, I, uh, I appreciate all of you willing to kind of give up your precious lunch hour um, for this panel discussion, because I know how valuable those are to everyone. Um, so welcome to our event. Um, I also want to thank those of you who, uh, as this is the end of our Domestic Violence Awareness Month, to thank everybody who has dug deep in their wardrobe uh, to find that last vestige of purple and can sport it today. So thank you for all of those who've done that. Um, I'm Tulin Smiley. I'm Chief Program Officer over Services at the People Concern. Um, and I oversee a variety of programs here at the People Concern, including seven interim housing um, sites, uh, as well as our very new site in Lancaster. Um, I oversee our health and wellness program, as well as our access center program and our Canine Connection program. And then I'm very, very proud and pleased to also oversee our domestic violence programs here. Um, we call the program Sojourn um, at the People Concern and I'm very pleased to be representing Sojourn today. Um, I've been working in the domestic violence field for about 20 years now. I started out um, in California at a, at a domestic violence shelter for almost eight years um, in Long Beach. And then I've worked, uh, uh, my last organization was uh, for almost five years uh, at a domestic violence and sexual assault organization. Um, and now I'm very pleased and happy to be here and part of Sojourn. So welcome everyone. And our next panelist. <laughs> Hi everyone, uh, I'm so happy to be here this afternoon. My name is Myung Kim. I'm the Senior Director of Clinical Programs at the Downtown Women's Center. Um, I've been part of the social service field for about 12 years now, and I started off working at a shelter um, that serves domestic violence survivors and their children. Um, I've currently been at the Downtown Women's Center for the past six years. Um, while here, I oversee our trauma recovery center where we work with women who have experienced trauma and have been recent victims of a crime. Um, I also oversee our mental health services, our case management and our health and wellness services. And I'm really excited to be here with our panelists and to speak with you all today. Nice to meet you all. Hi, my name is uh, Simone Fairchild, and I am the founder and CEO of Ion DV. We are the movement to eradicate domestic violence one soul at a time. Uh, we do so th through providing awareness, providing and referring resources for any individual who is or has been traumatized by domestic violence, and doing research and gaining the knowledge crucial to having an undeniable impact on legislation regarding domestic violence. I chose to participate in this event because I am a survivor of domestic violence and I receive services, care, support, counseling, love, respect, and a safe space to be me in the hands of Sojourn at the People Concern. I can't speak any more highly about Sojourn. It was an incredible,
incredible space with incredible people, incredible volunteers. They provided for me a sense of safety and support that quite frankly is really hard to find nowadays. And I always knew that I was going to come back and help in any way I possibly could. So when I was asked to participate in, in this panel, it was a resounding yes. <laughs> Wonderful, thank you. And last but not least, Eve. Hi, good afternoon. And thank you so much for having me on the panel. Uh, I'm honored to be with these wonderful women and thank you for joining us. So my name's Eve Sheedy. I'm the Executive Director of the Los Angeles County Domestic Violence Council, which to put it in context, a few years ago, the Board of Supervisors um, decided to change how we look at violence and to really look at violence as a public health issue, including domestic violence. So that sort of changes our perspective and tries to broaden the lens by which we look at the issues um, confronting survivors and perpetrators of domestic violence through more through a trauma lens. So I, I, was, uh, I am the initial executive director of the DV Council since the move to public health, although the council has been around since 1979. And the council is very quickly two things. One is the coalition of DV providers, survivors, government entities, and so forth, who um, convene and address various topics that we'll talk about later. And it's also a small office in our Department of Public Health. And the entire project is designed to raise the profile of domestic violence and to, and to improve the county's response to domestic violence on all fronts. Thank you. Thank you all, all experts in their field. Um, I want to start the discussion with a brief overview of domestic violence and the role it plays in our community. To Lynn, I'm going to have you start things off. And make sure you unmute too, just in case. Okay, thank you for that. Um, I'm gonna start off with a, just for those of you who are not familiar with the topic um, who've joined us today, I'm gonna start off with a quick definition for domestic violence. Uh, domestic violence is a systemic and pervasive pattern of abusive behavior perpetrated by one person over an intimate partner in order to gain and maintain control. You'll notice that the definition does not specify what constitutes the abuse. And we know that there is obviously, uh, generally speaking, physical abuse or physical violence, but we also know that there are emotional and psychological and financial, as well as other forms of abuse like sexual abuse that are involved in this. Not everyone experiences all of those levels of abuse, but they are generally present in many of the cases that we see. Um, so in terms of national statistics, um, according to the um, National Coalition Against Domestic Violence, in this current year, 2020, we've seen an average of 20, 20 people per minute who have been physically abused by an intimate partner. On average, 20,000 calls come to the national DV hotlines every day. Uh, one in four women and one in seven men have, uh, have been victims of severe physical violence that would take them to a hospital or an ER um, situation. Those include beatings, stabbings, burnings, um, and um, stranglings. Um, an average of three women, this is a common statistic that is cited everywhere, an average of three women are killed every day across the country. And more than 50% of lifetime victims of rape, uh, physical violence or stalking by an intimate partner who identified a need for housing services reported in a survey recently um, that they did not receive them. And that's something we're gonna talk about today. Um, on a, on a, in California, um, according to the Department of Justice, there were last year 161,123 calls to law enforcement involving domestic violence. Of those, 47% involved a weapon. And last year in, Cal in Los Angeles, 36,707 calls to law enforcement involved domestic violence. 
Um, that makes up almost a quarter of all of the state's calls to law enforcement. And what we know about those that statistic is that it is woefully underreported. So we know that there are many, many instances of domestic violence that are not being reported to law enforcement. Um, a little bit closer to home, I wanted people to kind of see what we're experiencing here at Sojourn. Um, last year, during the period between March and September, we uh, noticed 1,582 calls uh, to our hotline. This year, during the same period, which is particularly um, um, important for us because it is the period when we had our uh, closed down for COVID-19, we started our shutdown in March. And since then, we have experienced 983 calls to our hotline. What we'll notice is that the calls to our hotline have decreased, and we've seen this reported across um, similar uh, shelter agencies. There was a very big dip in the number of calls to our hotlines because people were really observing the stay-at-home orders. They were not looking to leave their uh, abusive situations, and they also knew that a lot of shelters were closed during this period or were not taking new intakes. And so they weren't calling our hotline seeking those kind of resources. At the same time, we've seen a huge spike in the actual number of DV incidents that are being reported to law enforcement, um, other um, hotlines for resources, um, and the number and severity of, of uh, domestic violence incidents has gone way up. Some reports are saying as high as 40 to 50 to 60% increase over prior year. So that's what we're looking at. Um, and this is the environment that all of us are operating in. Um, I also want to just briefly mention that the, everyone talks about the power control wheel and, and how that is related to domestic violence. And I wanted to mention that in COVID-19, abusers are using COVID as a way of um, implementing power and control over their victims. They're preventing their victims from using PPE, such as masks or hand sanitizers. They're preventing essential workers from going to work and doing the critical work that's necessary in our community. And that's part and parcel of the power and control wheel. So I wanted to, um, I wanted to then um, introduce Myung who's going to kind of take us into the next steps and talk about um, the causes, uh, the leading causes of domestic violence. Myung? Thank you, Tulin. So some of the leading causes of domestic violence include, like Tulin mentioned, power and control issues. The abuser feels entitled to take control over the survivor's life. Um, also, the abuser may have low self-esteem and they may feel inferior to the survivor. Um, there's, there could also be a family history of trauma and complex trauma. Studies have shown that children who grew up in violent homes also may grow up and cause violence and abuse with their partners and in their own families as well. There may also be un, uh, mental health issues. There could be undiagnosed personality disorders or psychological disorders, and also cultural and societal norms that normalize the belief that women are lesser than men. Um, for example, like toxic masculinity, right? It uh, enforces the belief that men and boys should not uh, express their emotions um, openly and that they have to be tough all the time and that um, violence is an indicator of power. Um, and then Tulin will go into talking about some of the myths and stereotypes of domestic violence. Um, there are a lot of myths and stereotypes surrounding domestic violence. Thanks, Myung. Um, I, I do want to just focus on three because I think they're the kind of primary ones that um, sh can shape our discussion today. The first one is that domestic violence is all about physical violence. And as I mentioned earlier, while we know that DV generally encompasses physical violence, we know that this is often accompanied by psychological and emotional abuse. Um, that's the name calling, the belittling, the denigrating, the you know um, making someone feel less than that goes into all of the leading causes of DV that, that Myung went into a little bit earlier. Um, but we also know that there's financial abuse. The abuser tends to control 
how, how or whether the victim is making money, um, whether or not they have access to funds. Um, and then we also know that there is sexual abuse, that, that the abuser quite often sometimes will make the um, victim do things that they don't want to do sexually or that they are uncomfortable doing. And we know that that's very much a part of, of, the, um, of domestic violence. A second myth that I want to talk about is that I've heard it very commonly said that domestic violence mostly impacts poor, uneducated women of color. And we know that is very untrue. We know that domestic violence crosses all ethnic, economic, uh, educational, and gender lines. Um, one of the very first cases that I ever worked with uh, in depth was a woman who had been abused by her husband for 17 years. She was a double PhD in economics and history. She was a professor at a leading university, and she was married to an extremely successful and wealthy businessman. They were the power couple in their community. And yet behind the scenes, she had been beaten for 17 years of their marriage um, to the point where when she came to our shelter, she, was, she had been beaten to the point where she broke her clavicle. He had broken her wrist and pushed her down the stairs so that she broke several ribs in the process. And yet she was the epitome of the successful, wealthy um, family member um, in the community. And so that really, help to debunk that myth for me. Um, and I know that a lot of our staff and a lot of our panelists here have experienced those same sort of um, cross um, ethnic lines, cross gender lines, cross educational lines, um, that anybody can be a victim of domestic violence. And the last myth that I wanna talk about is that people often say that domestic violence is a private matter between two people. You often hear people say, I didn't want to get involved in someone else's personal issues. I didn't want to kind of air somebody's dirty laundry. But really, domestic violence is a community issue. It's a societal issue. There are enormous impacts on the family. We know that working in shelters with children, they are experiencing PTSD and stress and trauma and depression. Often they come into our shelters, they're wetting their beds, they have poor school performance, and they, are, uh, they exhibit a lot of aggression. It's because that's what they're seeing in their families. And they don't have a way to express what they're experiencing and the violence that they're witnessing. Um, and so if we don't give them a language for expressing their feelings and we don't teach them how to end the cycle, we know that this is going to be a generational thing. And, and Simone is gonna to talk to, to, to you a little bit about that in a little bit. We also know that there are huge economic impacts to domestic violence. So an estimated $8.3 billion is lost as a result um, to domestic violence economically every year due to lost wages, um, lost time at work, um, um, the estimates are that there's an equivalent loss of about 32,000 full-time um, jobs that are lost to domestic violence every year. Uh, and then on a medical level, we know that there's a cost to all of the medical issues that people are having to address in emergency rooms and, in, and with their doctors as a result of DV. There's about a $4.1 billion cost a year as they relate to medical expenses um, across the country. And so there are significant um, costs and impacts to the community. So it is not about a private matter between two people. So I'm going to then now leave it to Myung, um, I think to take us um, through, oh, sorry, I'm good, sorry, I, I skipped a little bit. I'm gonna take us, uh, change tax a little bit and go into the intersection between homelessness and domestic violence. Um, so in, uh, in 2020, earlier this year, and as the pandemic was kicking off, we had the point in time homeless count in Los Angeles County. Um, and what we saw was that there were 66,436 homeless folks who were um, acknowledged and recorded and surveyed on the streets. Um, this it represented a 12.7% increase uh, over last year's homeless figures. And in the city of LA, this represented a 14.2% increase over last year's figures in the city. 32% um, of those who were on the street, who were recorded on the street were women. 22% suffer from serious mental illness. And 29% had indicated that they had had prior experience with domestic violence. 
We know that women experience homelessness differently from men um, and that sometimes for them, it is a much more dangerous endeavor to be on the streets. And Myung is gonna to talk to you a little bit more about that um, uh, in the work that she and uh, Downtown Women's Center and the People Concern are doing with homeless individuals. Um, so there are currently about 21,000 women experiencing homelessness in LA County. Uh, there has been an increase of homelessness among women by 40% and 16% among unaccompanied women. Um, so recently, there was a motion to designate unaccompanied women as a recognized homeless subpopulation. This was authored by Supervisor Hilda Solis, and the LA County Board of Supervisors voted unanimously to approve this motion. Um, LA is now only the second county in the country to formally recognize that individual women experiencing homelessness have unique challenges and needs. Um, and Los An and our Los Angeles County um, Council President Neri Martinez introduced a motion this week to do the city to do the same. So these are all really exciting motions, um, in, especially in the work with homelessness and women's advocacy work. All right, to Lynn and Myung, thank you so much for that overview. We really do appreciate it. There's so much to learn, so much to understand about domestic violence. How does it start? What is the progression of the violence to the manipula manipulation? What are the warning signs? Are there even always warning signs? I don't know. Um, and how can we all help? So Tulane, you touched on this a moment ago. It comes as no surprise that since the onset of this coronavirus pandemic, we've seen the demand increase in calls for domestic violence. Um, can you speak to what you've experienced again in the last seven months? Again, I'm gonna pose this question first to Tulin and Myung. Thanks, Rachel. So we did notice a, a pretty big dip in our calls to our hotline at the very beginning, the first two couple of months. And that was, as I stated, for a couple of reasons. I think people, first of all, were obeying the stay at home orders literally, um, which for some folks meant staying in their abusive situations. There is a lot of um, fear out there of the coronavirus, and so people were not willing to leave their homes uh, because they didn't know what was out there. Um, secondly, there were a lot fewer resources available um, in the community for to, to address domestic violence. There were a lot of shelters who were not, and we were we were one of them. We were not taking in new intakes at the very beginning because we needed to figure out how to keep everyone safe from the virus who was already in our shelter. So we adopted um, very strict cleaning protocols and um, PPE wearing um, and all of those kind of things. Um, and then we reopened. And as we reopened um, to take in new um, survivors, we noticed that the calls to our hotlines increased. And I think that is something that shelters were seeing across the county, um, that now we're starting to see the numbers increase across the county. Um, and um, so we're noticing that there have been huge changes in how people provide services, not just shelter services, but all the other services. So for example, our domestic violence training, our 40 hour training is now done virtually. And I'm happy to report that we are consistently seeing about 60, 70, sometimes 90 folks joining the training uh, virtually. Our support groups are also done virtually and our coordinator has indicated that there are great increase in the level of participation to the support groups because people aren't having to commute to the support groups. They're ha not having to find childcare and they don't have to find parking and they can still be um, supported in, in, in their empowerment. Um, and lastly, our, our legal services program has been switched to a virtual um, uh, method as well. Um, so a, a survivor can, can go on to Zoom, be connected confidentially one-on-one -on -one with a, a legal um, advisor, uh, a volunteer attorney, and they can, they can work on their issues in a private confidential setting. So in some ways, it has increased our services in other ways, it has kind of caused us to pull back a little bit so that we um, are, and are, are able to provide the services safely and in a healthy way for everybody. Thank you, Tulin. Um, I wanted to, I'm going to echo similar things that Tulin shared that the Downtown Women's Center that we've been experiencing as well. Um, due to COVID-19 and the pandemic, our survivors have reported experiencing some increase in challenges and unique challenges due to COVID. 
um, our survivors have shared with us that um, now that everybody is home, like Tulin shared, uh, their phones are being more closely monitored and they're worried about their abusers seeing text messages and phone calls from their caseworkers. And they don't always have the technological knowledge to like figure out how to um, um, hide that. Um, they're also having a hard time getting away from their abuser to make phone calls to their caseworkers, and because there are decrease of, and there are also a decrease of uh, safe options for them to go to at this at this time. Um, as Tulin shared, um, it is harder to find openings at DV shelters due to the shelters decompressing to meet the public health guidelines, um, and sometimes our survivors have shared that they that they have even had to look out of state. Um, we also noticed that hotels are also increasing their rates, and so it's been harder for people to afford to also go to hotels. And they don't always accept credit cards that are not in the survivor's name. So if our caseworkers or clinicians wanted to pay for a hotel with our company card, um, they're a little bit more hesitant to, um, to allow us to pay for that. Um, and, and they've also shared that there's been an increase of violence in their homes and due to the increase of stress caused by the economic stability and the stress from the pandemic. Um, our, our services have also transitioned. We are currently providing telehealth services and so, and on-site services. And so uh, for, for our survivors who do have access to phones, who do have access to internet and Zoom, we are providing that service through telehealth. But we also work with a very vulnerable homeless population who don't always have access to cell phones and, um, and laptops and computers. And so we actually um, opened up our services in our parking lot to provide um, extended services. And so if there are women and there are survivors who um, need access to, to speak to someone in more of a safe setting outdoors or in a, um, in a, in a on-site in-person setting, we are offering that option as well. Thank you. Okay, I think I'm supposed to talk about the number of beds and so forth in the county. So I'm just gonna jump in quickly. Um, it's a very difficult question. It should be an easy question. It is not. Um, data both in the county and in DV is a little bit difficult, but there are give or take about 1200 beds, uh, both emergency shelter and transitional shelter throughout the county, which has over 10 million people. And Tulin share with you some of the high percentages, but I do wanna highlight something positive. Um, in the city of LA, uh, when COVID started and the lockdown started, um, the mayor's office actually got a large uh, private donation, which enabled them to start a program called Project Safe Haven which was providing safe housing for survivors and their children um, that ended up, it's now going through the end of the year. They've housed over a thousand um, survivors and children since April. It's been really a sort of an overflow program. So in a circumstance where normally we, didn't, we don't have beds and the answer would be like what, what was said was people would say we're full that program, which was available countywide, um, really has enabled, you know, over a thousand more people to find housing. What was wonderful about what's wonderful about the program is it provided wraparound services, including case management and so forth. So the community is really um, banded together in order to provide services during this time. And I do want to just say this. Although many shelters um, had to close their doors right when the lockdown started because of the issues that were raised about um, uh, complying with the requirements to keep people who were there safe, all the other services, and I assume at Sojourn as well, continued. So the shelter-based organizations and the non-shelter-based organizations and the DV legal-based organizations have kept their doors open, their hotlines open, and so forth from the very beginning, they've done an outstanding job. I'm sure Simone's program also has been helping people and so forth. So I really want to um, both commend and acknowledge the hard work that all of these agencies have done. I know Downtown Women's Center as well throughout the pandemic um, in order to provide support for survivors. Eve, that is great to hear. Thank you so much. Um, so we do know that so much is stacked against victims of domestic violence. 
Uh, I can only imagine that getting out of an abusive relationship is scary, it's isolating, it's complicated. Um, so Simone, I wanna start with you. What are the systemic barriers in place uh, that victims face when they're trying to flee an abusive relationship? Well, what I have found is that uh, victims tend to be um, weary of leaving because of financial barriers, um, being alone, being afraid to be alone, not being able to take care of themselves or their children. Um, so that the financial dependence, um, having children in school and being fearful of having to uh, pull the child out of a supportive and um, consistent environment to put them somewhere else. Also the issue of psychological and physical trauma if they do leave and their abuser decides to come after them. Also, I have found um, that uh, a lot of survivors have a lack of evidence as far as building a case in many situations, like a difficulty in navigating the legal system, which I had, I, that was an issue that I had, to secure protections while dealing with um, the aforementioned uh, factors. And also being afraid and not knowing how to enter the DV shelter system in LA. And also like the lack of beds and resources and not knowing how to go about to get resources and really just fear to be quite honest, um, how, when, when I was going through this, I, I exhausted every last resource humanly possible, possible. So by the time I left my abuser, I tried everything. We had gone to, I was, I had my own therapist. So we tried going to that therapist and he wasn't receptive. Um, I was also building a relationship with God. So I was in uh, life groups and he decided to stop going to church and tried to get me to stop going to church and believing God and staying with uh, my life group. And he tried, tried to keep me from um, friends, tried to keep me from family, tried to keep me from working, tried to keep me from socializing, tried to keep me from, tried to cut me off from every single, um, different thought, every every single possible way to get any sort of resource known to man. But like I mentioned, I had my own therapist. I had my life group. I had my growing belief in God. I had a very, very dear friend who had spent 20 years in a um, abusive relationship. And I also had a friend, which was very unique, a friend who was my abuser's dear friend who had known him during his previous relationship. So she knew how he was and she was also a licensed therapist herself. So eventually um, God told me, you have to leave. He said, flat out leave. And so that exact same week, my therapist told me, I know I'm not supposed to tell you this, but your relationship has gotten to the point where in the power and control wheel, there is a portion that is called the honeymoon phase. And typically once that honeymoon phase has disappeared, where your abuser tries, like buys you flowers and tries to butter you up again and, oh, you're beautiful and I'm sorry. Once that disappears, then the physical violence is going to increase. So my, um, my therapist said, your relationship is turning a very dangerous corner. You need to leave. And I also had the uh, lady who was our mutual friend who had known him for a very long time, who was also a therapist, said that you know how he is. So you can either make the choice to stay, knowing how he is, and that's going to get worse, or you can make the choice to leave if you can't handle it. So when I was posed with that question, I knew unequivocally it was time to go. I had to leave. And once I knew that, then I was in action mode. So I found the resources, I made the calls, I called shelters, I called friends to make sure that uh, we were gonna have somewhere to go. I tried to line up employment. I tried to, um, and I made sure we had transportation. So once, once I made that decision, now mind you, this night might not be the right decision for everyone. Sometimes your relationship can work and no victim wants to leave their abuser, to be quite honest, because they love them. If I could have stayed, I would have. But at the end, 
one of us wouldn't have survived if I didn't leave. And thank you for that, Simone. Before we hop over, I do want to just follow up on something interesting that you said. So you said you guys went to therapy. I'm just curious, can DV abusers rehabilitate, rehabilitate long term? And if they can, what are the success rates if, if you have that information? Um, I've been talking to uh, different therapists about this to get their opinion on it. And uh, the latest beha behavioral therapist that I questioned about it, she said that it is possible. It's a small percentage, it's, it's, the likelihood is small, but um, it all depends on what the cause of the abuse is, like what the root is. Um, for instance, if it's narcissism, the, the percentage is, is pretty small, but possible. So it, there is room for hope because, um, Specifically with a uh, narcissist, it is, they have to be able to take responsibility for it, for their actions, and put one foot in front of the other and continue to battle it every day. And, and that's, that's difficult. But the, the percentage is small, but it's possible. Okay. Can Thank I just, you so much. And, can I just yeah. jump in? I do want to say this. I agree if there's some... If there's a some sort of serious diagnosable issue, that has an impact. But as we look at this as a public health issue, one of the basic tenets is that violence is learned. Mm -hmm. And that when we look at trauma sort of through this larger lens, that we have that we can address trauma, that we may not have all the tools, and maybe the batteries intervention programs that we've developed are not the best tools depending on who delivers them. But I, I do want to say, I personally know people who used to be violent, who are no longer violent. And I think as um, we move forward, we have to keep in mind that this concept of redemption and of changing conduct is something we really want to work on. Mm -hmm. We don't want to alienate people from engaging in these processes to reduce violence overall. Eve, thank you. And thank you, Simone, for sharing that. Um, there's so much to learn, so much to overcome for victims who are trying to leave that critically dangerous situation. Um, I just want to now move forward with what are the resources? How can we help them get out of this situation? Uh, what are their options? So I want to know what are the immediate services that Sojourn, the People Concern, and the Downtown Women's Center provide to victims of domestic violence? And I'll start with Eve. Okay. Actually, I'm going to turn it over to, to Lynn. Uh, the DV Council actually acts as sort of a convener, so we don't do direct services. I uh, will give it to Tulin. Thanks, Eve. So at Sojourn, we obviously provide both a, an emergency shelter and um, a, a second stage shelter for uh, folks fleeing domestic violence. But we also have a lot of wraparound services. We do provide on-site um, counseling services for survivors. We provide support groups for survivors. Um, we provide legal assistance and um, education for survivors who need to navigate, as, as Simone was mentioning, a very complicated legal system. Uh, and we have a very large community education um, uh, and awareness and engagement program um, where we do domestic violence training, um, healthy relationships training, we do empowerment groups, we do all of those things that will help to support and address the root causes, um, as both Eve and Simone were mentioning, that it's, it's a cycle of violence. And if we don't figure out how to talk to children um, so that they can learn from their experiences and grow from their experiences and heal from their experiences and figure out how to express what they're witnessing, it will be translated to the next generation. And so part of uh, a large part of the work of Sojourn is even in the shelter setting is to work on an empowerment model, is to work on giving them language to express what they're, um, what they're experiencing so that we can end the cycle um, with this generation and not pass it on to the next generation. Myung? Hi, thank you. 
um, at the Downtown Women's Center, I wanted to share about a couple of our programs. Um, one is our Trauma Recovery Center. Um, our Trauma Recovery Center, we work with women who have been a recent victim of a crime, such as sexual assault, domestic violence, or if they're fleeing domestic violence. So if we, we provide very low barrier services. And so if someone calls up our info line or comes to our, um, our on-site services and lets us know that they're in danger and that they need support, we have crisis counselors and case managers that will respond to them immediately to start safety planning, to help them to get to the hospital if needed, to make police reports and all of that. Um, so through that, we provide crisis uh, counseling, crisis case management services, um, we do not have hotel vouchers. There is like a rumor out there that we have hotel vouchers, but we do, we are able to pay for hotel and motel stays if that is the, the best plan for the survivor in the moment. We also can provide transportation to, um, to safe settings. So if the survivor identifies other family or friends, even if it's out of state that they can get to, then we will purchase plane tickets and bus tickets to get them to where they need to go. Uh, we also have a community-based domestic violence housing program where we work with survivors to get them housed uh, permanently into independent housing. And so we have clinicians and case managers that provide that support to help them through those steps. Can I just add, Rachel, that, that in addition to the wonderful services at Deme uh, Downtown Women's Center, um, Sojourn also has those um, similar um, case management services, um, counseling services, and are able to then work with the survivors on getting them to their next phase, wherever it is, whether it's a transitional program or into their own, um, um, you know, houses and homes. Um, and um, so we, we will work with them on the housing issue as well. Obviously, as part of the people concerned, that's what we do. We, we, we work on housing folks who are homeless. And so very much a part of uh, the work that we do with uh, domestic violence victims. Thank you so much. And I'm so happy to hear that there are so many resources in place already available for victims. So thank you for the information. I'm gonna ask Eve if she can talk about the key policy efforts that the DV Council is working on right now. Sure. Um, I do wanna say the DV Council has a hotline which you'll get the information, which is actually a pass through to some of these wonderful organizations that you've heard about, but it, it is available 24 seven in multiple languages. Um, but really what we're trying to do is break down the silos as if we had 12 more hours, we could talk about how much DV is connected to every other issue that there is. We've talked about, we touch on some of them, homelessness and so forth. But the DV council is really working on that. We have a huge, uh, an, a series of projects ongoing with the Department of Children and Family Services, which are unique in that we have partnered with them to really analyze and address the community, DB community, survivors and so forth have partnered with DCFS to really investigate particularly the issue of using the charge of failure to protect against survivors um, and getting them into the system where they may lose their children when all that's happened is they've been victimized by someone else. We work very closely. We are starting a group to address domestic violence and mental health, which is actually being co-chaired by someone who has come out of a program from Downtown Women's Center, which is actually an advocates program that comes out of their TV Homeless Co Services Coalition. So we are connecting some of the dots. We do what we are doing presently, an ongoing series of conversations about how the DV community can better support um, the Black survivors of DV and particularly Black service providers of DV because unfortunately, historically, uh, the domestic violence field uh, was not really focused on those the equitable issues that it needs to be focused on. I'm happy to say that that's changing, but it's a work in progress. And the other thing we do, in case anyone's interested, is we send out a daily email that keeps you apprised of everything that all these under, other wonderful people are doing, as well as funding and so forth. So, thank you. Great, and there is so much, as we know, to change and to improve. And I'm proud that the county's Domestic Violence Council has this all on their radar. Um, Simone, this is to you. I know that I on DV does a lot to empower women. Can you talk about it? Sure, thank you. Um, 
Ion DV empowers victims by showing them how to get to the point of thriving one step at a time. Uh, the object is to give just enough resources to get them to the next step in their journey. Uh, the vast majority of victims are already so overwhelmed that they can't handle really much more than that. It, the idea is to help them get to the next step and safely. Okay, so what's the next step? Okay, here's how to do that. Okay, what's the next step? And so on. The idea is to empower them into bringing them back into the natural space of being able to think calmly themselves. Um, IONDV also empowers victims to reclaim their power by reclaiming their voice. I find that to be a huge deal because I come from that space myself. Um, I'm naturally a quiet and on the shire side type of person. And um, so this is uh, scary for me to be honest <laughs> with you, but um, my situation caused me to be almost absolutely silent. I wouldn't say anything uh, unless it was to people that I absolutely trusted. And thankfully God put those people right in my path. So the majority of what I try to do through Ion DV is to help people to regain their voice simply by sitting down with them and giving them a safe space to voice whatever it is that they're feeling. They can talk about what they did that day and eventually they get into telling me their story and how it began and how they got there. And, and, and it's just, it's absolutely wonderful. Um, I find that to be the most helpful thing. And I will say also too that um, typically each victim has been silenced by their abuser and how deep that loss goes is mind blowing. Um, like I said, <laughs> I fight the urge every day to stay safe and remain silent. It's very difficult. Um, but to, to empower others to speak up is, is, the, is my number one thing. And that allows, if you don't, if you remain silent, this allows DB to perpetuate virtually unchallenged generation to generation. And we have been talking a little bit about how domestic violence is generational, is passed down. So Ion DV empowers people really to face their fears without realizing it, to reclaim the you that has been so deeply suppressed. Thank you, Simone. And you just talked about the importance of confiding in people that you trust. So as allies, how can we help and how can we support victims of domestic violence? And, and I actually do have one more thing I wanna add, one more question. If someone, if someone confides in you that they are experiencing domestic violence, they are being victimized, mm -hmm. what is your responsibility once you hear that? To sit and talk and listen, most importantly to, to listen, because they have been put in a space much more likely than not that no one will listen simply because out of fear for themselves or because of what they're experiencing in their own lives, they can't handle any more pressure than what they're dealing with on their own already. But just to sit and listen. And based on what that individual is telling me that is going on, I will make suggestions as to what type of resources that they could take the next steps into getting, or I could reach out and find these next steps or these resources for that person based on their specific needs. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And Myung and Eve, I'm gonna have you hop in and get in on this discussion too. Okay. So, oh, go ahead. I was just going to echo sort of what Simone said. I think, and some of the issues are really just, again, approaching people in a trauma informed way to really, it's not only, it's listening and it's supporting someone else's choices. That everybody is in a different place in their journey. And our job, particularly someone like me who works, you know, in a, a government setting in public health is really to find what will help that person as they state it, not as what 
what I might think or what the person sitting next to me might think, but really our job is to, as Tulin has been saying, create a language where people feel comfortable talking and then being responsive to what their needs. Everyone's at a different point in their journey and it's not for us to decide what point that is, but it's to help them, as Simone said, get to the next step. So I will pass it over. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I just echoing to, um, in addition to what Simone and Eve uh, shared is that we don't want to judge people for where they are in that relationship. You know, Simone shared clearly that, you know, sometimes there's love in the relationship. And so we don't want to judge someone for wanting to stay in the relationship. Uh, we don't want to force conversations and be another authority figure in the survivor's life telling someone what to do. So it's really important that, you know, Simone shared to give that voice back, you know, to empower the survivor to be able to make their choice, whatever that choice uh, may be. And it's important to remember that, um, that it takes a survivor about seven to 10 times of leaving the relationship before they actually leave. And so as an ally, as a service provider, you might be um, the, the, the second time that the, survivor, that the survivor tried to leave, or you might be the third time, you know, talking to them the third time that they tried to leave. So really remembering, like as Eve shared, that this is a journey for the survivor and it's not about us coming in and telling them uh, what to do. Um, and, and lastly, just asking them, what can I do to help you versus going straight to you need to leave, you know, because they, survivors know that, you know, and so, um, but instead the question is, what do you need? Like Eve shared in a trauma-informed perspective, what can I do to help you? You know, um, what, you know, what, what's happening? You know, can, let, share your story with me. And so just really being that person there for them. Thank you, Myung. And the work that you all are doing is critical to Lynn. I wanted to ask you how we can all get involved in the organizations and if you could talk about the hotlines as well. Sure, of course. We welcome anyone's um, support um, and, and volunteering. Um, there's a lot of ways that you can participate and engage uh, in this in this fight that we're that we're doing. Um, you can volunteer with any of our organizations. You can donate to any of our or organizations, whether it's in kind or financially. Um, you can help join the advocacy fight. There are lots. There's lots of legislation. Eve is very familiar with all the things that we're doing to promote this. Uh, to be able to support survivors um, in their ability to both heal and then move on to accessing a safe ho housing. Um, if you're looking to be an ally and you don't know how to do it and you don't know how to reach out to somebody who looks like they need help, you can call our hotline and talk to somebody and say, I think I know somebody who may need your services. How do I talk to them? And our wonderfully trained volunteers will be able to walk you through those steps. So any one of those things, that if you want to be an ally at all in any one of those avenues, you can call our hotline. And I'm going to give you the hotline number for, it, for everyone. Um, but it will be sent to everyone so that they can have it. It is 310-264-6644. Again, it's a 24 hour hotline and you, you can be a victim. You can be a victim looking to leave. You can be a victim looking to stay, but get support or mental health um, counseling, or you can be an ally who just wants to figure out how can I help everyone? Um, how can I support the work that you're doing? How can I volunteer or donate? All of those, you can call our hotline and, that, and, and we can get you started down the road. Thank you so much to Lynn. And as we know, allies and support are critical in ending this cycle of domestic violence. So again, thank you for the information and how we can get involved. It looks like we have about six minutes left in our program. So I do have some questions um, that I wanna get to. This one probably for you, Simone. The first is where is I on DV located? Sure, uh, I on DV is based in Los Angeles. Okay. <laughs> How would they find you, I guess? Oh, sure. Um, so IONDV, they can check out the website. It's uh, www.iondv.com. If they want to um, reach me directly, they can email me at info at iondv.com. Also, if they want to check out any of the interviews that uh, IONDV has done with uh, various 
professionals and other um, survivors, they can check out uh, IONDV on YouTube. And there's also the IONDV Instagram and Facebook, which I check and post daily. So yeah, that's it. Thank you. You're Second welcome. question, and I'm going to open this up to all of the panelists too. With shelters closed due to COVID, where did people go if they needed to escape their abuser? So I can answer that to some degree. And I am going to add one other thing about the hotline. But the, um, like I said, at least within LA for this period of time, there was this extra housing through Project Safe Haven. There was also a project through LASA. Project Room Key, which actually housed a number of DV survivors, but it was under different limited circumstances. But um, so 10 agencies, I think 10 or 11 agencies were sort of the gatekeepers of Project Safe Haven, where people would contact them again through the hotline and could get housed that way. And that is available through the end of the year. And I do want to add one thing about hotlines. Many people don't reach out to hotlines because they feel like they they have to know what they want to do. They have to know, oh, I want to leave. Oh, I want this. Oh, I need this. Oh, I need this. And they don't. The benefit of calling a hotline is you're talking to someone who's trained, who knows, who wants to talk, and they can, they can help people go through those conversations. So I think sometimes our message um, gets misinterpreted and really, the hotline people are there to help, to help people walk through that conversation. And Simone's there to help, to help people figure out what the steps are. And they don't have, people don't have to know what to do. They just have to know they want to talk to someone. And also people who are friends and families and colleagues of people who are addressing DV can also call hotlines to get advice about how to talk to someone. What can I say to my cousin to my friend how do I how can I best approach them and you can talk I'm volunteering you Simone but she can talk to you about that also having been through the experience so it's important to know that these resources are not just for this moment of crisis but the resources are there to help people find their way so wonderful and I want to squeeze in one more question because we have two minutes left um, keeping in mind that DV is cyclical, which agency is providing counseling to abusers? And that's for anyone. All right, there, well, I mean, there, you go. You go. There are several um, organizations that, that work um, through batters and intervention programs, and specifically there are programs that work, uh, for example, Mentor is a program that works with um, um, men and, and, and boys to, um, to address some of those toxic masculinity issues that were discussed earlier today um, to help prevent the next cycle uh, the next generation of abusers. And so there are a lot of programs that are working with abusers in the community. Uh, we, at Down to Women's Center, we don't have like an abuser specific counseling program, but our mental health services are available to anyone who wants to access it. And so, um, as you know, as I think Tulin shared with, uh, with domestic violence, it's not just to, limited to heterosexual couples, you know, and so it's also prevalent in our LGBTQI uh, population. And so we have also worked with clients uh, who are in same-sex relationships who uh, might identify as abuser and wanting to work through those issues. And so, uh, so we don't have a specific program, but we are open to taking on um, referrals. Wonderful, thank you. Well, I'm, oh, nope, go ahead. <laughs> I just wanted to add as well that Ion DV also, um, the space that we create for, um, for individuals to come and have a safe space to talk about their experience is also extended to abusers as well. Because most times abusers have experienced um, abuse in their childhood or previously, and that has caused the, the, the issue to perpetuate into their adult life. So. Uh, creating that space for abusers is also something that IONDV does as well. 
Very good to know. Thank you all so much. I was going to say we have reached the end of our time together, unfortunately. But thank you to our expert panel leading this discussion. And also, of course, thank you to you all for joining for this very important conversation. You will be able to find a recording of this discussion at thepeopleconcern.org. And we hope you have a safe, wonderful holiday weekend. Bye.